According to St. John, the second chapter, beginning at the first verse. Glory, Glory be to the Lord. Lord. On the third day, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the marriage with his disciples. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, O woman, what have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. But his mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now six stone jars were standing there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the steward of the feast. So they took it. When the steward of the feast tasted the water now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the good wine first, and when all have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the best until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to thee, O Christ. Christ. May I speak in the name of the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was invited to preach this morning, Colin said to me, if you want to preach hellfire and damnation, that's fine by me. <laughs> well, I don't want to go quite that far, but I do think at this time of the year, a few reminders might not go amiss for all of us. I'm sure I'm not the only one who opens a new diary for the coming year full of good intention and ends the year with very, very many blank pages. The only exception for this, or for me at least, was the year of the interregnum when I was in danger of not having pages that were big enough. But now that's passed and I want to begin by thinking about how we fill those blank pages. In other words, how we fill our life. It's extremely difficult at the moment with none of the usual marker points that we're used to. We have one service per week and we have no social events. So we really don't have a lot of planning concerning church to consider at this time. Well, I'm sure I'm not the only one who finds that life is difficult to pace. You're never quite sure what you should be doing in the next week, unless it's a hospital appointment, which is the only thing that we seem to put in diaries and calendars <laughs> these days. There are very many jobs that I've been promising myself that I was going to do, and my chief executive is quite expert at reminding me of many of them <laughs> but I seem to find that more are added to the list than I'm clearing. So I have to admit that the following wisdom story does strike an uncomfortable chord of my conscience. It's called The Devil's Apprentices. I don't know who wrote it but it's very pertinent. It was the start of a new term in health and the devil was giving an induction course to a new batch of apprentices. There's no room for complacency, he warned them. You wouldn't believe half of what's going on on earth. People are getting more and more in touch with God. They're starting to see God in creation, not even in each other's hearts. <coughs> They're noticing God's action in the stories of their lives. And worse than that, they're starting to realise how important it is to work for justice and peace. 
if they carry on like this, God's kingdom will come and we'll all be out of a job. There was a long silence as the seriousness of the devil's message sank in. The apprentices waited to hear what wisdom the devil would give them for dealing with this perilous situation down on earth. But he could read the question in their minds and he turned the whole problem over to them. So, what are you going to do about it, he asked them. Any bright ideas? They scratched their heads and furrowed their brows. Come on, urged the devil, I'm waiting and we don't have forever, you know. Very tentatively, the first apprentice raised his arm. Sir, he ventured, why don't we go down and tell them there is no God? Sorry to disappoint you, the devil said, but that won't wash at all. They seem to be born with something deep in their hearts that attracts them back to God. They often can't name it or even admit that they know that God exists. You have to come up with a better idea than that. Crestfallen, the first apprentice sat down and the second apprentice raised his arm. So he suggested, perhaps we could go down and tell them there's no such thing as sin, so they don't have to worry. Hell is just a myth. A good try, said the devil, but unfortunately, the same bit of God that's deep in their hearts also tells them when they're going off course. They know, if they stop to listen to that inner voice, that it's all too possible to commit sin. And they know that when they do, they can feel terrible afterwards until they put things right again. Deep in their hearts, they know what sin is and they know how hell feels. Think again. What about you, he said, turning to the third apprentice. What have you got to say for yourself? Well, replied the third apprentice, slowly and thoughtfully, I've been giving it a lot of thought. You say that it's no use telling them that there's no God, and that it's no good telling them that there is no sin. How would you be if we told them that there's no hurry? The devil was delighted. Brilliant, he squealed. That's exactly what we'll do. You go far, young demon, well done. So it came to be that the human race carried on, believing in God, knowing about sin, but never doing much about it because, after all, there was no hurry. Now I'm going to draw a few comparisons between this story and the present situation that our country finds itself in. Not the same, I know, but it does make me think, I hope. Some four years ago, we voted to leave the European Union. And yet the final agreement was not reached until just a day before Christmas and a week before we finally were leaving. You can almost hear the civil servants in London and Brussels saying, well, we've got four years, no hurry. Now we seem to live from day to day waiting for the next restriction on our lives in an attempt to control the pandemic. It threatens our very existence. I'm very sure that many of the measures that are being drip-fed to the country were discussed and even agreed by the authorities many months ago. Unfortunately, the powers that be seem to feel that we can't take all the bad news at once. I have to say I'd strongly disagree. I think people are much happier being given the facts so that they can adapt their lives accordingly. No hurry. How many times has this phrase been used by each of us? Personally speaking, far too often. And at my age, it simply can't be justified, <laughs> especially in some uses. I'm now realising that time is not on my side and I must get on and do things rather than think about them as something for the future. No hurry really is the philosophy of the devil. And yes, I really believe that such a being exists. Not with horns and a pointy tail and carrying an oversized toasting fork. <laughs> no, I believe that devil exists in many forms. And I give you a couple of reminders or a couple of examples. Credit cards. Apparently cheap credit purchase. These seem to be targeted at those least able to pay for what they want catering for the, I want it and I must have it now for eternity. 
Higher Purchase used to be called, and it was in a lifeline for poorer people. But it was, in a way, it had a social stigma because people thought that they ought to save up first and then buy what they wanted. Now, it's available in many different kinds, for all kinds of goods, usually the expensive ones. And it's available with a minimum or with no deposit, and in some cases, no payments for two, three or four years. It just seems too good to be true. And it is, for the day of reckoning must surely come. Gambling, one of my great ret noir, especially online gambling, often the advertising seems to suggest that this is the way to get out of your debt problems. The inducements alone are too good to be true. It's often said that if an offer seems too good to be true, then it almost certainly is. And I must admit, I find it very difficult to understand the government's lack of action when on the one hand they state that they're concerned by the level of gambling addiction and yet do very little to control it. You can always imagine some civil servant muttering, there's no hurry. It's a problem that can only get worse the longer the restrictions on social gatherings are in place. The true problem, of course, is that addictions are much easier to adopt than they are to shake off. They just seem to get worse. We began at first with a simple lottery. It seemed a good idea, supporting good causes, the possibility of a modest win. The same applied, of course, to premium bonds. But now the lotteries have become almost uncontrollable. Multiple lotteries, many of them offering multi-million pound prizes. I have only one explanation for that kind of activity, greed. The devil must be feeling very happy with the mess we humans have created. Well, enough of the hellfire and damnation, for now anyway. There's only one way that we can begin to recover, and it's by going back to the teaching of Jesus, both in his words and as interpreted by St Paul. Both are going to be vital for our recovery from the pandemic and then for the recovery of the world. Use the talents you're blessed with for the benefit of all, as Paul said. His definition of love must surely rank as one of the greatest expressions of man's ambition for a life that we believe God really intended. Or, as Jesus reminds us, love your neighbour as yourself. I have said many times before that adversity brings out the very best of human nature. We've seen this expressed in many ways during the pandemic by the NHS, where many worked ridiculous hours to cover staff shortages, to the many volunteers in the many, many organisations, often unpaid, who risk their lives to help others. The army, who seem to have become the catch-all for all organisational problems. And of course, we mustn't forget the many thousands of volunteers who provided food and support for those less fortunate. True expressions of loving your neighbour. It's going to take a long time for things to get back to normal, but God willing it will. But we have to keep praying and ignore the deluded ones who think that there is no hurry. Amen.